Good morning. And welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church on this Palm Sunday. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the folks that helped us with the Community Linton Luncheon here last week. I know the youth set up tables and there were lots of folks who made soup, arranged flowers, decorated, served, and cleaned up. And I want to say thank you to each one of them. I also wanted you to know that Peggy Reed came with one of her homemade pancakes. <laughs> our beloved members who is 90 years old and is famous for her homemade pancakes. Back when the pandemic hit and we were all just sort of paralyzed and not knowing what to do, Peggy called me and she said, you know, there's a young woman that sits in front of me at church and I'm worried about her because she's far away from her family and her friends and, and if I had to make a pancake, will you take it to her? Because my children won't let me leave the house. I said, yes ma'am, I will do that. So when I came to pick it up, she goes, and you know, I have another and you know, so and so has a bunch of kids, and you know they're having a hard time. Will you take them a pound cake? Yes, ma'am, I will. And then the next week she called me and she said, You know, I thought of a few more people that needed a pound cake. Well, every week she would call me so much that I ended up having to find helpers to help me deliver pound cakes. Eighty-seven households got pound cakes with strawberries, because Peggy insisted they had to have strawberries with them. Not just our members, but uh, neighbors and folks in the community that uh, people knew were struggling. Um, she showed us a way forward in that. And that same team that delivered pound cakes so many years ago continues to deliver things to our homebound members and other folks that are struggling. Today, they'll take some communion bags to folks who can't physically be here in worship. Next week, they'll take flowers, um, uh, vases of flowers to folks who are shut in or people who, uh, who, who can't leave the house. So it's a wonderful ministry. And if that sounds like something you would like to donate a little bit of time to or a lot of time to, then you're welcome to join us in this great ministry. Tonight, the trustees meet at 530 and the youth have an egg hunt. So uh, parents of youth, please send eggs with whatever, filled with whatever you think your team would like, within reason. And then on Thursday, we have a Monday Thursday service at 6 o'clock. And we will end that service with the draping of the cross for Good Friday, which is a beautiful and powerful tradition in our congregation. Our children's Easter egg hunt is this coming Saturday at 10.30. So I invite you to come. You can bring your grandchildren. You can bring your neighbors and your neighbor's kids. Um, you can invite random strangers. This is not one of those, like, thousand children mass egg hunts. This is a, a, a smaller one that is uh, especially good for children who have special needs um, and, and families that just want uh, to be with a community of folks instead of sort of being in the thick of uh, the Easter egg frenzy. So please invite folks to come if you like. Um, and as Lady McClellan has an update on our Island Trinity Building campaign, I'm going to invite all of the children to follow me to the back of the sanctuary. Your parents or grandparents can come to us. As Lenny talks, the children will follow me. Good morning. Um, my name is Lenny McClelland, and I had the blessing of uh, getting to come to Trinity in 1996. I actually grew up in Tuscaloosa, but I grew up downtown at First Memphis. Um, but in 1996, I was um, blessed to come as the associate pastor here and had the other fortune to get to know the families that go to this church. Some of them are your parents or your grandparents. Many of them have passed on. But the church remains as they give to us. So we are very grateful and each week someone has come to tell you about what we need to do and how it is now our turn to take care of this gift. I don't think I can improve upon those words, but what I can do is give you an update about the deadlines. Because if you're like me, sometimes you need to be reminded that this is not something to do next week. Uh, at this point, we are doing well, but we have still not met all the goals of uh, those special matching gifts that have been generously offered. Um, so if you haven't put in your donation yet to the I Love Trinity building campaign, that's specifically not your pledge, but to continue to prepare the church. We've talked about the air conditioners, the uh, windows. Generally, this church is uh, in need of comfort.
constant up here. So, if you haven't yet, we would like to invite you to remember that by April 15th is when we would like all of those donations in. If you are like me, uh, and you think about, well, I'd like to do this, but I can't do this all at once, another option for you is to pledge a certain amount. You can pledge a certain amount that you will be getting over this next year about December 31st, and then put it in that way. But just let us know what you would like to do. You know, back in the day when those wonderful families built this church, uh, they probably brought cash or a check. Uh, we have so many other ways to do this now. So you can look on the back of your bulletin and see the ways that you can donate to Trinity, whether through your regular pledge or the Southern Trinity Fund. There's everything from um, just handing in a check to cash to your banking bill pay system to PayPal. And actually, I believe we now have a Venmo account set up for those of us who don't have PayPal but use Venmo. Um, and I believe the percentage is less on that. But you'll need to contact the church office to confirm that. But please reach out to us if you have any questions about how you can be a part of continuing to make this church the wonderful place it is together. Thank you. We'll also say on April 16th, we will gather for our outdoor worship and then we'll announce the total. Now, if you would rise as you are able before our parade and join me in our call to worship this morning. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, rejoice in the Lord is the Christ comes with joy and hope.
And as you look around, whatever inspires you and gives you hope, uh, whatever gives you joy, from the turning of the seasons to the blooming of the flowers, we will also lift up those prayers of joy and hope as well. On Saturday, we gather them all together and lift them up to God. So I invite you at this moment to take a deep breath and just to settle your hearts and your mind and your bodies as we go to God in prayer.
Lord, today we know that there is tremendous violence and tumult and grief in our world, and we hold up to you all those this week who have suffered trauma. We hold up all those who have experienced violence. You understand violence, Jesus. This week we remember that you looked into the teeth of violence. You took it on. You were crucified and you took all of our violence and you turned something terrible. And you turned it and you used the most evil thing so that you could do an abundant good. You turned our violence and through your love, you transformed it into the redemption of humanity. We ask for that transformation, Lord. We hold up our world to you. We know that your love will save us. As we proceed through this holy week, we lift up to you all those who are struggling in other ways. We lift up to you the ill. We lift up those who feel far away from you. For anyone who feels that you are not near, we pray that you would reveal yourself in your presence and they would your arms wrapped around them. We pray, Lord, for our families. We thank you for children. We thank you for children's voices. We thank you for what you will do this week. We ask that you would empower us to be your church, to be your witness in the midst of a tumultuous world. That you would help us to show your love and your peace as we remember what you did for us, that you came here and you taught us how to pray. So now we pray in the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now will the children please come forward. Yeah. 
obey God, but it also means save us. So they would wave their palms to him and they would say, save us. And then as Jesus was coming by, um, it was kind of muddy. And there might be like some stuff on the ground where animals had walked before. And I didn't want Jesus or his donkey to step in. So they would put the palms on the ground like that. So that Jesus and the donkey could step on them. That's okay. So today, you can remember that it's Palm, we call it Palm Sunday, because these are called Palm, Palm Branches. And we remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem. Would you say a prayer with me? Repeat after me. Thank you, Jesus, for praise. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus. For your son, Jesus. Amen.
Our call to new scripture is from Matthew 21, beginning with verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord has a need of them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill with what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle, and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went, and Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In case you were wondering, the current population of the city of Tuscaloosa is approximately 102,339, according to the population review. But on game day, another 150,000 people come to Tuscaloosa for the game, even though the stadium only holds about 102,000 seats. That means on game day, Tuscaloosa is the largest city in the state of Alabama, followed by Huntsville and Birmingham and Montgomery. On game day, the university says that they set up 325 portable toilets, although I have not actually seen any of them in New Carolina Bryant. They said they set up 12 air-conditioned restroom trailers, 400 trash cans, 130 recycling containers. It is a big deal to have that kind of influx of visitors on game day. Well, if you take that number of people in Tuscaloosa on game day and double it, and then add a few hundred donkeys and goats, then you will have Jerusalem at the time of Passover. Passover was the biggest event of the year, and half a million people came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast with friends and family. And one particular Passover time, there was a significant parade. Actually, there were two parades on this day. The first parade came in from the west, and it was led by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. He would ride in full military gear on a grand and beautiful and strong horse with an ornate saddle. Behind him, there would be hundreds of cavalry, hundreds of soldiers, and Pilate was, Pilate was heralded as, quote, the Lord and Savior of the world. That was his title, the Lord and Savior of the world. It was a title given in the year 30 to Tiberius, who inherited it from his stepfather, Augustus, and Pontius Pilate uh, now became the Lord and Savior of the world. This fray was a show of power and of force, and it was designed to remind the peasants who was in charge and who had power. It was a warning to the people where there were all of these visitors, all of these outside agitators. It was a warning to the people not to step out of line. Do not challenge the empire. You need to be afraid, very afraid. And during this parade, there were very few tears. It was mostly silence and awe and fear. Now, at the very same time as this parade, there was a second parade on the opposite side of the city coming from the east, and it was this man of no particular family with no great wealth, riding not on a beast of war like a grand horse, but riding a simple donkey, an animal that was really only fit to work in the fields. And the man's saddle? All it was was cloaks coats that people had loaned or given to him. And as he rode by, the people in the parade would literally take off the shirt off their back and lay it in the street for his donkey to walk on, for him to pass by. Now, ancient 
he had flaws, and that the man was in debt, he could come back and take pretty much everything he owned. You could take his land. You could take most of his clothes. Uh, you could take his livestock. But there was one thing you could not take from a man, and that was their cloak. Less substantial garments, yes, you could totally take it as collateral. But a person's cloak is considered to be in a category by itself. A cloak offered warmth and peace and protection. It provided modesty, making sure that nobody could walk around naked. It doubled as a shelter, uh, functioning as a cloak by day, and at night it became your bedroll. So no one could take your cloak from you. The only way somebody could get your cloak is if you gave it freely. And as Jesus passed by, people took the cloaks off their back and laid it at the feet of Jesus as a way of saying, I will give you anything. I will give you everything. And as he rode by on the symbol of peace, people would cry, Hosanna. And most of the time we think that means praise God or yay, yay God. It didn't. Hosanna meant save us now. Save us now. Save us to the highest heaven. May the highest angel in heaven hear us proclaim, save us now. Save us from the Romans. Save us from those evil oppressors. Save us from those bad tax collectors. Save us from those cheating priests. Save us from our heartache and pain. Save us from the violence that we are experiencing every day. Save us, Lord. This second grade might even be might even be seen as political satire. Almost as a joke, the exact opposite of this great, powerful, wealthy king, this military of great works. And then <coughs> this man, simple man riding a donkey, a symbol of peace. And the poor people flocked to him. They praised him and they thanked him for his help. I wonder if Jesus was riding by today, what would we cry out to Jesus today? What do you need saving from this week? Oh Lord, save us from the economy. Save us from war. Save us from global warning. Save us from illness. Save us from a dysfunctional family. Save us from crooked politicians. Save us from violence in our schools. What would you cry out to Jesus today? Save us, Lord. As we imagine people lying in the streets and imagine palms and the coats on the ground, people willing to give Jesus anything and everything, I wonder what would it take for us to get off the shirt off our back? What would so move us that we would want to give our whole heart to something or to someone? What would it take to move us to give of our time and our best talent, to give of our resources? What would it take to make ourselves vulnerable and exposed? Most of us don't want to be that vulnerable here personally or professionally or economically because, first of all, we're terrified of not having enough, of not having the things that we need or that our children need. But sometimes I think we're afraid that we won't have enough that we can't offer enough, that we can't be enough, that maybe we're not even worthy enough to cry out our deepest pain and fears to the God of the universe. Maybe we're afraid that what we have to give won't really matter, that we can't really make that much of a difference. Two parades on this Palm Sunday, one parade with Pontius Pilate, where people were made to feel small and afraid and powerless. And then a second parade with Jesus, where people were bold enough and brave enough to ask for what they needed and to give all that they had. Today, we still live in a world of two parades. In the one parade, there's still people who will make money off of making you afraid. There are people who will make money trying to convince you that the world is terrible and that it's going downhill and that people are awful and bad and things are getting worse and worse and 
users who profit off of other people's pain. And then there's Jesus. And Jesus' parade, who with humility and grace, invites us to create with him this new kingdom on earth, who invites us to this place of love and grace and justice, who not only invites us but commands us to love other people as generously as Christ has loved us. We live in a world of two grades, a parade of fear and a parade of grace, a parade designed to make people feel small and powerless, and a parade that empowers people to speak and to act with courage and with love. Which profession do you want to be in? Not just on Palm Sunday, not just on Holy Week, but every day. Hosanna, we cry, we cry save us, Lord, from thinking that who we are and what we do doesn't matter. Save us, Lord, from our selfishness and our small mindedness. Save us from the darkness within that makes us cynical and numb to those in need. Save us from thinking that we can't make a difference. Save us, O oh Lord. And lead us into your future. We live in a world of two parades. Which one will you choose? Our closing hymn will be Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Choose the way of hope and love and grace. May God work in.